How's everybody doing today? Happy Friday to you. What's uh, what's Jim Traber's uh, Happy Friday music? What is that called again? Be Happy Friday music. I need to have that playing whenever we come in. Be Happy Friday music. Lift the mood in here a little bit for you, right? All right. Uh, well, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, um, kind of mid mid April and in in, uh, in the building, and so a lot of stuff going on, and just open it up for uh, comments or questions. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I, have, I haven't seen it. I've talked to the speaker about it. And, and um, you know, we obviously have to know who's coming into our into our country. And I think it's an effort to really try to stop the tide and make sure since the Biden administration is not securing our southern border, we think that President Biden has the tools that he needs. He's not doing it. And so states are then forced to uh, stop the migration from coming. So when when you automatically can get led into a country with all the services, all the free medical care, all the things that are happening, then that's creating this ma mass migration. They have to go back to the Trump era policies, which is remain in Mexico. Um, and so we believe in, we believe in, in, in immigration the right way. We need more workforce, um, but the way it's happening is not, uh, is not working. And so states are forced to try to do other things to stop that tide of migration. And so supportive of that. Yeah, you know, I don't want to weigh in or, or criticize. I don't know what all the stuff that was happening in D.C. at that time. Uh, do we need a strong border? 100 percent. But we know I've personally been in the, in the White House with uh, Secretary Mayorkas, also President Biden, and asked them, why aren't they using the tools in their tool belt that President Trump used uh, to secure the border? And uh, you just get a lot of noise. You get a lot of spinning in a circle. Well, we need more money. We need we need Congress to pass something. We don't believe that. They're, they do not need more money and more bill to actually change the policy to remain in Mexico and stop this tide that's coming in. So would you consider setting up a new unit like the Immigration Highway Patrol to target illegal immigration? And what kind of uh, financial or technical assistance would you provide to local law enforcement agencies? Well, we'll see what happens with that bill. But no, we're not targeting, we're not targeting anyone. We're just saying that uh, this is not going to be, Oklahoma is not a, not a sanctuary state. Uh, we will follow the rules in the state of Oklahoma. You have to apply for work visas the proper way. Um, you know, I've been I've been a proponent for H-1B visas at state controlled level. So we we know that our our uh, construction companies are manufacturing and we need workforce. Um, and so so we we want legal workforce that is contributing to society 100 percent. That's totally separate than border security. And right now we're talking about border security. How do we secure our border? You talk about the people on the terrorist watch list. You talk about the Chinese nationals that are coming through, the illegal uh, entry into our country. It's what it is. It's, it's illegal. And so it's just it's a mind boggling to most Americans that um, we're not we're not enforcing existing law. And the best example, the, the way I explain it, there's already these ports of entry. It's illegal to enter anywhere except these ports of entry. And they're cutting razor wire. Governor Abbott's doing everything we can he can to secure the border, and we stand with him uh, for that effort. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Is it on? Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, this is in regards to SJR thirty four and uh, the judicial nominating committee. So the coach himself, Barry Swift, who you might know, sent a letter saying no, basically to SJR thirty four yesterday. He said it would remove the people from the judicial selection process for absent judges. Uh, fellow judges and allow the governor to pick the new judge. So Coach says no, and he says it should be approved by the people, not necessarily one person. What do you have to say about that? Uh, I, I wonder which lobbying group got a hold of him and paid him money to write a letter. So, um, but the the uh, federal system works very well, and if the legislature puts that on my desk, uh, we'll sign it. Um, when I first came into office, there were nine different sections in the state that the Supreme Court had to be chosen from. And so it's really problematic. Um, we want the best and brightest minds on our state Supreme Court. And when you're limited by 
uh, geography, it's a problem when you're limited by um, who's going to go through the process of this uh, board. It, it limits. Sometimes you have to recruit the best and brightest. I've learned that through my cabinet secretaries and actually going out. These people are very, very successful CEOs or running big law firms. And when the governor comes and says, hey, have you thought about serving your state? Um, it's different than actually just applying through some kind of uh, committee and trying to get through the, to the governor's desk that way. So I'm, I'm supportive generally of giving the governor the authority. I'm the one that's elected by Oklahomans and the next governor is going to be elected by Oklahomans. Why do we tie the governor's hands uh, behind his back and create all these boards and commissions and unelected bureaucrats that then are driving policy for the state of Oklahoma? Uh, and so generally, I believe that you, you got to have one neck to choke. Right. And it's the governor's or if it's not the governor and you want to tie the governor's hands, there's nothing that really the people of Oklahoma understand or can go. They can't choke this unelected board that nobody knows who it is. So give the governor the authority. And uh, and let's put if 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 Oklahomans wanted uh, my opponent's values, they would have elected for my, my two opponents, but they wanted my values. So I never apologize for putting my values of limited government and lower taxes and free market systems and a fairness uh, in our judicial system uh, on these different boards and commissions. And that's what Oklahoma's elected me to do. So I, I love it. I think it's great. Governor, we're talking a little bit about legal matters and I wanted to know whether you... There's a... Oh. Uh, we're talking a little about legal matters, and I wanted to know if you've tracked some of the legislation that the, that, uh, the House and Senate are considering. One is to uh, decrease the uh, threshold for felony burglary, I believe it is. And then uh, there's some other things that may be run a little contrary to some of the criminal justice reform that I think you have supported in the past, trying to lower the prison population, things like that. I mean, there's even a bill that would make it a felony punishable two to five years in prison knowingly transmit HPV. Uh, and so I'm just curious if you have concern that the legislature is again looking at rolling back some of the efforts that you've supported in the past on criminal justice reform. Yeah, you know, I'm very proud of, of, uh, um, of our state. We are a law and order state. I've given our law enforcement pay raises. I've given our Department of Corrections pay raises. Um, we're we're going to support law enforcement first and foremost. Um, and then when I, when I think about the second chances and how our system set up, I compare us to other states. When I took office, we were last place in incarceration rates, okay? So Oklahomans think that's weird too. I do too. I don't think our people are any different than any other state. Why were we last place in incarceration rates? And uh, so I've gone about to say, hey, there's some people that we're locking up that we're just mad at, we're not really afraid of, they're not a danger to society. So let's figure that out. And we've moved 10 spots. I've saved the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars by closing four prisons, two private prisons, just since I've been in office since 2019. So I'm not going to let us go backwards on uh, some of those criminal justice things. There's sentencing reform that I want to get through uh, this year as well that I think we've been negotiating with the district attorneys that hopefully we'll get across the finish line. And then there's a real problem uh, with some of this. Um, you know, smash and grab and some of the things that are happening to Quick Trip and Walmart. And if you know that you can go steal something and it's under $1,000 and you're immune from prosecution, uh, that's a problem. So I'm very sensitive to fixing that for Quick Trip and keeping those employees safe because you talk about uh, the employee safety issue, that's a big problem if they're trying to stop or trying to protect their assets. And then there's other further violence that happens inside those uh, retail establishments. So um, specifically, I don't know exactly where the bill is, but I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I want to help, I want to help our retail establishments make sure that we can prosecute, give our DAs the tools to get bad people off the street. Okay. Uh, but I'm not going to let it go backwards. And that's why we need sentencing reform. Sentencing reform, think about this for a second. It's not fair for somebody to get 30 years in this county and to get one year in this county or probation. And that kind of stuff happens. So let's determine in our in our committees what we've done is we brought all the groups together to say what is this crime punishable what, what what sentence should this person have and then let's have it more uniform so let's bring those those uh, 
the flexibility or the or the or the, or the scope of the punishment and kind of bring those in a little bit. And I, Texas went through that. And so that's one of the sentencing reform things I'd like to get across the finish line as we're making sure that we can punish these bad apples that are going into these convenience stores and, and retail establishments and, and knowing exactly what they're doing and stealing under a certain amount. But the other problem is if we go to $500, uh, you know, some of the tribal laws are at a thousand. So again, I always talk about that. We can't have two sets of systems. You can't have a Hispanic, a white person, a black person being a, getting a felony for stealing something at $500 and Kevin Stitt as being a, a member of the Cherokees, I don't get punished until it's over a thousand. That's weird. Oklahomans think that's weird. Uh, I'll continue to remind people we have to have one set of rules regardless of your race. It's, it's like I'm in a twilight zone having to explain that. Good morning. This week there was a report a number of employees that have left the State Department of Education up to 130 now um, since Superintendent Walter took over. Democrats are calling for investigations, impeachments. There's some very flat Republicans you're hearing maybe saying the same thing. Kind of what's your take on the state of that agency right now? Um, and do you think any, any investigations are warranted into why are all these people leaving? So we've got 130 people that have left the State Department of Education. Um, Jinx Public Schools, nobody's left Jinx. Nobody's left Tulsa. So you're telling me that we've lost 130 bureaucrats up here in Oklahoma City and um, we've still got our education system rolling across the state? Sounds like a good thing to me. Governor, how are you, the relationship between the Senate is not the most positive budget is still being discussed and debated. Have you read with Senator Tree or what are your plans to uh, get the budget on my city? So the first part of your question was uh, the relationship's not good yeah, with well it doesn't seem to be very positive right now. With who? Senator Tree. Okay. Uh, listen I'm not going to speak to that. That's that's your words. But uh, no, the, the Senator Treat's not asked us or showed us any kind of Senate budgets. We've seen them roll that out. We love transparency. Um, I'm asking for a budget before the end of the session so Oklahomans can uh, understand what's happening. We need to get that budget done. I know there's a lot of talk between the House and the Senate right now. And again, big picture, uh, we cannot spend, we've got to spend what our reoccurring revenue is, right? So what is our income? Let's make sure that we don't obligate Oklahomans more than our income, right? So that's one thing. And then we have to maintain a savings account. So we're in a great situation. The economy is booming, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a proponent to, you know, blow through all of our savings. Are there strategic investments we want to make, but let's keep around $5 billion or a little under in our savings side. And then let's strategically invest in things, but let's not raise all these agencies where now we're obligated for more than our actual income is. And that's that's pretty common sense to me. I think Oklahomans agree with me when they sit down at their budget at the end of the year, they're not gonna design their budget to spend more than their income. And so why would I do that as Oklahomans? So as long as the House, the Senate is spending under or right around what our income is, that's really what I'm asking for. Other than that, they have to decide what programs to to fund and, and, uh, and then what strategic things should we invest in for the long haul. There's long-term capital planning things. There's some deferred maintenance that we can invest in because our economy is so good and I'm all for that. There's roads and infrastructure and things that we can do one-time investments, but I'm always gonna be very, very uh, on flat budgets or making sure we, we, we stay right around what our income is. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. Yeah, just as a general rule, when we've got smaller government, that's what I'm for. That means we have to spend less tax dollars to fund a bureaucracy. Um, but listen, uh, Secretary or uh, Superintendent Walters is separately elected. Uh, I don't get into the details. He runs that agency. That's his agency. The way our state's set up is we have these separately elected officials. And so uh, I'm not going to get into how he runs his agency. He's separately elected by uh, the citizens of Oklahoma, um, but I'd much rather it be 130 uh, fewer 
government bloat than 130 more. So. Yeah, so, so this is something that's really, really important that, that people need to understand. So when you drive on our turnpike system, okay, um, call me crazy, but everybody should pay the same amount that drives on our turnpike. Right now, the Cherokees, they owe the state of Oklahoma for Cherokee tags $4.7 million. At the end of this month, it's going to be over $5 million. Then the next month, it's going to be over... 5.7 million, then it's going to be, I may bring a graph next time to show you how this is coming. Um, the Creeks, they, they owe the state of Oklahoma $1.8 million for these illegal tax that are running up and down the turnpikes. So that bill, all that did was it, it allowed the OLS, which is Highway Patrol, to be able to share the information with the turnpike authority so we know how to bill those people. Representative Goodwin, Representative Hardin, Representative Humphreys, Representative Kane, Representative Lowe, and Representative May voted against it. It's a head scratcher. I have no idea why you think that you should allow one race of people not to pay on the turnpikes. Furthermore, let me read you what the obligation is by the turnpike authority in the bonding. Okay. It says the authority covenants that tolls will be classified in a reasonable way to cover all traffic so that the tolls may be uniform in application to all traffic falling within any reasonable class, regardless of the status or character of any person, firm, or corporation participating in the traffic. No reduced rate of toll. The authority further covenants that no free vehicular passage will be permitted over the Oklahoma Turnpike uh, system. So, we're breaking the law by allowing vehicles to run up and down the turnpike without collecting it. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why everybody's not outraged by this. Uh, and you'll have to go ask those six people why they think that's a bad idea. Um, again, I, I'm, that was a shocker for me. But guess what? The Indian tribes were all around the room with their lobbyists walking these halls, influencing, saying, Hey, give us a special exception. They don't have to pay. We don't have to pay these fees. I, that's the only logical explanation: is they're being lobbied by um, folks that want something for free, and they want everybody else to pay for it. it it's going to cost Oklahomans a lot more money if we don't get this fixed. Uh, it's going to continue to escalate and escalate and escalate. By the way, I've already got compacts with the Chickasaws and the Choctaws where we share that information. So when those when those license plates are on the turnpike. They're able to go the pay play or they have the um, um, the toll just like everybody else. That's all we're saying is treat everybody the same way. You'll have to ask those six people why they think it's a good idea uh, to set an exemption for uh, illegal plates running on our on our turnpikes.